Welcome. Um, this is the first hearing in this Congress uh, of the Subcommittee on Antitrust Competition Policy and Consumer Rights. I'd like to begin by thanking my friend and colleague, Senator Klobuchar, for the tremendous job she did in chairing this committee before me. And um, I'll note that she and I have always had a very good uh, uh, working relationship, and we share uh, the same basic goals for this subcommittee, uh, which involves ensuring first and foremost that consumers are protected from those who would abuse the marketplace, and second, that we perform effective oversight of the Department of Justice's antitrust division and of the competition side of the Federal Trade Commission. I look forward to continuing that bipartisan work in this Congress, and I'd like to thank Senator Klobuchar and her staff for their hard work in preparing for this hearing. I'd also like to thank the chairman of the full committee, Senator Grassley, for supporting this hearing. Senator Grassley was planning to be here today, but he's stuck on the floor managing some human trafficking legislation that's pending this week. Uh, a few housekeeping matters uh, before we begin that I'd like to address. After Senator Klobuchar and I give some opening remarks about the hearing, we'll hear from our panel of witnesses who I will introduce a little bit later on, and then we'll have uh, five-minute question rounds with our panelists. Um, now, today's hearing deals with a serious issue, and I trust that members of the public who are here will act accordingly. I want to note at the outset that the rules of the Senate prohibit outbursts, clapping, or demonstrations of any kind. Uh, and it, this would include blocking the view of people around you. So please be mindful of the rules as we conduct this hearing. Um, I, I, I don't think this will be necessary. I certainly hope it won't, but I'll ask the Capitol Well, Committee's. it depends on what you say. Yeah, exactly. There could be a lot of clapping. Exactly, yeah. All right, I, all right. I guess we have some role in that, right? Um, but uh, if it becomes necessary, I'll ask the Capitol Police to remove anyone who violates the rules. Um, if you'll indulge me, I, I want to provide some background on this complicated issue, an issue that uh, perhaps could be familiar to some in the room, but is not familiar to most Americans. Um, this hearing is about the market for music. Specifically, it's about the market for licenses to publicly perform copyrighted musical compositions. What does this mean? Well, every song has an author, the person who wrote it, not necessarily the person who performed it or the person who recorded it. And that author has a copyright in that song, meaning that anyone who wants to perform it in public has to get a license from the author in order to do so. Which turns out to be a lot of people. Lots of businesses play music for customers. Radio stations and internet streaming services like Pandora or iHeartRadio are the obvious examples. But there are all sorts of other examples. You've got bars and restaurants that play music to set an ambience. Uh, you've got retail stores that do the same thing. Television networks and cable companies that air college football games uh, where there's a marching band in the background, and that marching band tends to play music, and that music tends to be copyrighted. All those people need a license for every song they play, or else they have to pay enormous damages to the copyright holder. But the market could not function if every neighborhood restaurant had to go look for every author of every song it wanted to play and negotiate with each one of those authors for license fees. Nor do individual copyright holders have time to contact every bar in America and ask them for license payments. As a result, for more than 70 years, publishers and songwriters have relied on performing rights organizations, or PROs as they're known in the industry, to license music on their behalf and then collect and distribute the royalties. The two largest PROs are called ASCAP and BMI, and we're pleased to have representatives of both of those organizations uh, here today as witnesses. Both ASCAP and BMI sell blanket licenses to all works in their inventories, and between the two of them, those licenses will cover most every song. Roughly speaking, and the number is debatable, ASCAP and BMI each control approximately 45% of the market. 
The remaining roughly 10 percent belongs to two other PROs, CSAC and Global Music Rights. So what does this have to do with antitrust law? Well, it turns out that virtually the entire market for the licenses we're talking about is governed by a pair of antitrust consent decrees from a long time ago. In the 1940s, the Department of Justice separately sued ASCAP and BMI over concern, concerns that they had violated the Sherman Act through aggregating control of the music license market. DOJ settled these cases and entered into separate consent decrees with ASCAP and BMI in 1941. The consent decrees are somewhat unusual. They're perpetual in duration, and they essentially function as a kind of regulatory system for the price of these music licenses. The decrees contain requirements that look very much like a compulsory license and royalty scheme. Specifically, they require that the PROs offer a fair rate on a non-exclusive basis to any user requesting a license, and that they not discriminate uh, uh, among similar licensees. Any disputes about the rates are to be resolved by the judge in the Southern District of New York who oversees the decree, a process that has come to be known as rate court. For almost 75 years, the consent decree ruled ASCAP and BMI blank blanket licenses have allowed consumers of music to have access to virtually the entire catalog of written music by negotiating with just a few entities. The system has allowed innovative distribution methods to arise while enabling individual songwriters to get royalties from thousands of bars, restaurants, and radio stations across the country. Then came the internet, and things changed. In 1995, after the advent of web streaming, Congress decided to require internet companies who perform, publicly perform music but no one else, to pay royalties to recording artists and record labels, you know, the guys who play the songs rather than the people who write them, in exchange for requiring the record labels to license their, wor their works. In other words, Congress set up a scheme on the sound recording side that looks very much like the scheme the consent decrees set up on the musical composition side. The major difference, however, is that the price of royalties for composers is ultimately controlled by judges, judges supplying antitrust law, and the price of royalties for recording artists is controlled by the Copyright Royalty Board, uh, which is a panel of administrative judges housed in the Library of Congress. And these two groups of people do not agree about the price of a license to play music on the Internet. The Royalty Board sets rates for sound recordings played on internet radio that were substantially higher than those the rate court had set for the underlying compositions. For example, in 2013, Pandora paid approximately 48% of its revenue to recording artists and record labels, and only about 5% of its revenue to songwriters and to publishers. This disparity in rates led publishers to believe that they would be able to achieve better rates outside the consent decrees. So they made a request of ASCAP and BMI. They asked ASCAP and BMI to change their membership rules to allow something called partial withdrawal, meaning the right to exclude digital services from the blanket licenses that they normally sell. That would require companies like Pandora to sep separately negotiate with publishers for public performance licenses at whatever price the market would bear. All of that led to litigation that is still pending. It also led to allegations that the music publishers, who think that their judge-set royalty rates are too low, were colluding to keep Pandora's prices high instead of competing with each other to drive, uh, to drive consumer prices down. In a lengthy opinion, Judge Denise Cote of the Southern District of New York ruled that publishers had no right to partially withdraw their digital rights from the blanket license under the ASCAP consent decree. Judge Cote also rejected publishers' attempts to use the prices they negotiated with Pandora while they tried partial withdrawal as benchmarks 
for setting prices generally, noting evidence that the publishers had cooperated instead of competing in those negotiations. That case is now pending on appeal, and even as we speak, a different judge in the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York is now conducting a trial uh, concerning similar questions under the, uh, under the separate BMI consent decree. Meanwhile, the Department of Justice's Antitrust Division is currently considering, um, uh, currently considering uh, an effort to modify the consent decrees to allow partial withdrawals, among other things. That would have another, uh, a number of important consequences that today's panel can discuss. On the one hand, the publishers say that uh, partial withdrawal will allow them to negotiate prices with internet companies in a free market. And surely the most striking feature of the current system is that there is no free market at work. On the other hand, others believe that after partial withdrawal, the market will not really be free uh, because a few mu music publishers control most of the licenses and they've been accused in the past of colluding to drive up prices for consumers. In short, what to do about these consent decrees is a hard problem. And it's one ultimately that affects many millions of Americans. Today, we'll hear from a variety of parties affected by the consent decrees, each with a slightly different place in the market. Here, we have an opportunity to discuss openly the topics that DOJ is discussing privately. As we listen today, we must remember that we have both a responsibility to encourage create <coughs> creativity by recognizing the value of copyrights, and we also have a duty to ensure that prices for music remain competitive for consumers. Senator Klobuchar. Well, thank you.